We have one thing left to do before talking with Mid and leaving the Ancient Library, and this is important enough to have its own entry because we are going to Iron Dupe. We're going to glitch 255 eaters of an encounter here and sell that for easy money, rack up resources, all that good stuff. So the first ingredient of an item dupe are ninjas, we need uh, the throw command, so Paris goes to ninja. You also want to set the kunai and the star rope manually on Faris. this is to boost agility by a couple points and guarantee that she will be faster than the thieves who are going to do the other half of the item dupe. But um, uh, you don't want to optimize, if you optimize you're going to equip the mithril knife on the offhand and ninjas can dual wheel weapons, but we only want one mithril knife on inventory and equip that mid battle so that it leaves uh, an item slot uh, behind, an empty item slot, and this is a requisite for performing the item dupe, so make sure that you only have uh, one weapon on Faris and uh, leave the offhand free. Next we need to heal up the party because uh, there is a fair chance that we're going to get hit by physical attacks uh, during the dupe. So we need to patch our wounds and make sure everybody is in tip-top shape for the uh, glitch. And uh, we're going to turn the others into thieves. Lena to thief, Galuf to thief, and Bartz also goes to thief, but he has a bit more of a complex setup because he's going to help us during the Iger catch. And he also needs to be a thief for the black chocobo catch. And uh, uh, he just sees more use uh, as a thief as a result. So you want the black command, it can be either level 1 or level 2. Level 2 means it's slightly stronger, but ultimately you only want access to the fire spell or bolt spell. That's enough for the setup. And also, if you bought a couple mithril knives on uh, Karnak, as you should have uh, if you did the complete shopping list, then you want to optimize or equip the mithril knife on Bards, because we need a single mithril knife on inventory so that it leaves an empty slot behind. And, uh, but if you only bought a single meter knife, then you can just leave that alone. And we can uh, um, do the glitch now. Um, before me, we need four steps. We're going to get an encounter right behind the mid, and it's going to be with a page 128. So this guy is excellent for duping because he only has um, uh, Eater to steal as a common steal, no rare steal either. So it's not like we're going to randomly get a different uh, item on occasion. So it's consistent. Very safe as well, because he only has a single target, and we can use a seat tide while the dupe takes his course. So, in order to item dupe, the first thing you need to do is uh, underflow an item as well. And uh, in order to do this, you need to equip uh, an item as, uh, a weapon mid-battle, and uh, set it up on one of your hands. Also, make sure that you don't have an empty slot behind the slot you are going to underflow, because uh, uh, the way on underflowing works is that we're going to glitch an a slot and then set an item on top of it via stealing, which is one of the few ways we can accomplish that. And uh, uh, stealing prioritizes the first empty slot it has uh, available, so you need to make sure that the uh, stolen item falls onto the glitch slot. So make sure that the material knife is on near the top of the inventory and there is no empty slots behind it. Uh, but yeah, we equip the Mithril Knife on the offhand for Faris, and then we go back to the main menu and then throw the Empty Slot. The reason this works is because the uh, Empty Slot sort of acquired the properties of the weapon that, had, uh, that it had when we equipped the weapon. So now it gained the property of uh, being able to be thrown, like the Mithril Knife, so we're going to throw the Empty Slot. Now what's going to happen is that it's, uh, this is going to display M5, so we threw an empty slot which uh, had a quantity of zero, uh, but when you throw an item you consume the thing you threw and uh, uh, it deducts uh, the quantity of the item by one. So the slot went from zero items to minus one items, but in Final Fantasy V negative numbers do not exist, as is the case for many SNES games. So uh, to compensate the game uh, wraps it to the next uh, item on the list, which uh, behind zero will be 255. So right now we have an empty slot with 255 um, of quantity, and what we're going to do is steal an item on top of it and add it to the empty slot. So now we're going to steal the eater, hopefully it doesn't take too long, perfect. And uh, when we have the eater, notice that now we have a zero eater, so, which um, means that we had an addition. From, we went from 255 to 256, which is not a number that exists in the game per se. So what's going to happen 
uh, when we leave the battle, the eater is gone because it just had a quantity that just didn't register for a game. So we needed to assign a value that the game can interpret so we can take this glitch slot elsewhere in the run. So what we're going to do is uh, take the eater, the glitch eater slot, and then use it in battle, and anybody, it doesn't matter, whatever, just uh, deduct uh, the uh, quantity. Uh, so now it went uh, from zero to once again 255, and this is a value that the game uh, can uh, hold. So now we can flee from battle. So the item dupe setup is very simple. Equip uh, a weapon, leave an empty slot behind, throw the empty slot, steal on top of that empty slot, and then consume the empty slot so that it gains a value that the game can interpret. And uh, if done correctly, we're going to have 255 eaters, and we, and we can interact with this slot. Uh, we cannot use it because uh, past 99 items, the game just gets confused. But uh, we can sell this on a, at a store with a proper quantity that is 255. So that is um, uh, a complete item dupe performed. And we're going to take full advantage of uh, this glitch slot to uh, acquire better armor, better equipment, throw items for ninjas. And uh, there is a backup if you're outside of a step route. You don't have to search for a page to 128 on the first uh, uh, formation. Although I don't think the game is going to be kind enough to let me show this off, but uh, you just want to walk around uh, this area until you encounter either a page 128 or a page 64. Uh, with the page 64, you just throw a flame scroll that we got on Ifrit on Twin, and uh, with that, uh, the page 64 uh, is defeated, and a page 128 will pop up instead, and uh, that's uh, your target for the item loop. And uh, yeah, that's not it. It's not a difficult glitch. And uh, this is pretty much the major, the biggest glitch that the Spearon uses, because there are no sequence breaks in this game that we can take advantage of. But uh, it's a very useful one at that, makes uh, routing a lot easier for sure. Okay, so that is the first thing we need to do on this segment. Now, on the way back to Karnak, we're going to uh, catch an Eiger, which uh, we require to defeat a boss later on. Uh, you need to catch it on somewhere within these squares. Uh, but we just do it on the way to Karnak because our job alignments also help with uh, uh, the air catch. It makes it a little easier. So here, when you when you are covered by the foliage of this uh, patch of forest, you want to do a pause. Yes, a pause. And uh, then we're going to switch everybody to front row and have our cursor end on Galuf. The reason we do this is because uh, past this point, we, are, we don't have to tank physical damage nearly as much as we did on early game. And uh, have you noticed how when you select a command and your character is about to uh, execute an action, they move to a certain spot on the field and then they attack, uh, right? Um, so if you move your characters to front row, they will get into that spot uh, quicker than they would if they were on back row. So generally, it's better to have people on front row because they execute their actions a tiny bit faster and this adds up uh, when you repeat actions over and over and over again on a battle. Um, if you're on back row, you also escape from battle a little quicker by a few frames because you get off screen faster because you escape from the back row position. So yeah, your character is actually physically moving on the field and that makes uh, quickly you can input things. But um, it's just an optimization and we don't have to worry about this too much. And so uh, that's the first part of the setup. And now we want uh, Galuf as a knight. We just want a job class that's slower than uh, Mediate or Lena, but knight is the quickest one to select. And yeah. Uh, Lena goes to Mediator, and so she's going to do, perform uh, the uh, task of catching the eye gear and uh, using it on battle later. But yeah, that's the first step, and now we just keep uh, walking. Doom de doom. Yeah, and over here we're going to get the encounter with the eye gear. So, if you didn't kill anything on the Karnak explosion sequence, you can do this very easily. Um, first, you want to throw a broadsword, the spare broadsword we, we, we've been saving, onto the eye gear, and this is always going to net you a damage range of. Uh, 155 to 160, something like that. But it's never going to overshoot uh, 160 damage, which means that now the Aegir is on catching range. In order to catch enemies, they need to be at 1 8 of their max HP, so um, you just have to divide uh, 180 and, uh, by 8, and then you will get the amount of HP that you want to uh, be able to catch uh, the Aegir. So the broadsword with a high roll gets you the damage range. If it gets a low roll, then you will need to cast a multi-target black spell on the entire enemy field just to uh, chip at the Aegir a little bit, and then it will be on catching range. But yeah, the broadsword used uh, 
makes this setup a breeze. Then you catch the Aegir, select it, and as you do, you start uh, fleeing with Galuf. Uh, we want Galuf to have a slow turn here so that he is queued up and is able to run away before the enemies attack, but I took a little while with my actions because I was explaining things, so um, that didn't wind up happening. But yeah, if you are quick, you should never get attacked on the battle, and even if you do die, it doesn't matter because you get a free heal on Karnak, so there is no reason to worry about that. Um, but now I gotta show you the backup in case you level up uh, on uh, Karna Castle. So, what you want to do in that case is, um, is change your setup a little bit. You want Faris to have the black command equipped. Uh, next, uh, you also want uh, Galuf to have the black command to weigh you in damage, and then you want to set the entire party on back row <laughs> because you will just have to tank a few volleys of enemy hits before. Um, getting a chance of catching the eye gear. So on this case we need to count damage. We have to target the eye gear slowly, but surely he will fall onto catching range, so we just have to count. Okay, I'm just gonna pull my calculator here. This is now a tool assisted speedrun, it's illegal. Okay. 40. Then we're going to cast once again. If uh, Bars has black level 2, then his damage will be a little bit stronger. So that's something else to keep in mind. Plus 55. Then it has to defend. Galuf gives me plus 55 once again. He must have le uh, Black Magic level 2 as well. Okay, we're at 150 damage. So that means that we need at least one more multi target uh, Black spell. So you just want to chip the majority of the health uh, on the eye gear through single target Black Magic spells. And then when you are getting closer to the catcher range, you start uh, multi targeting the fire just to chip it a little bit. So now we're at 158, which means that we need yet another attack. So that is fine. Bars will never kill this guy. And a range of count. And now he's on catching range. We can now have Lena take care of this. And hopefully flee before the enemies attack me. Nice. Okay, I'm a little bothered about the fact that the enemies managed to get me. <laughs> Let me redo that battle to see if I can do the strat right. Let me show off how, uh, what to do if you get a low roll, but it didn't happen this time. But if you're fast with your inputs, you should never get hit. Notice that this time Galuf didn't queue up a turn before uh, Lena caught, and uh, this way you guarantee that you flee from the battle. So, uh, gotta be quick with those. Right now, I'm just going to show you the way back to Karnak. And we walk a few more tiles up, uh, skipping through the desert, and uh, pause here. Pause in this indentation of the patch of grass. And then uh, we want to avoid the vent tiles uh, on Karnak Castle on the way back to Karnak. Uh, next up, we got another uh, plot uh, uh, trigger to get rid of uh, before we can access the steamship. Head to the upper floor of the bar and then you get this cutscene. And now we can head out. This is a last reminder, if you didn't buy everything you had to on Karnak on your uh, second visit, then this is your last chance because we don't return to this town ever again. So remember to get the extra ice rod, the extra Mithril knife. And on the way to the steamship, we want to avoid the Valentiles once again, so make sure to walk down and then left to reach uh, the boat. And we have another cutscene to take care of here before um, navigating the oceans. Gotta talk with uh, Sid. Talking with me does nothing. It's just extra dialogue. And now, boarding the steamship, we want to be at 134 total steps. 